Thank you, London Carrier. And uh, so we welcome the return now of Samira El Bajo. So I'm going to be reading three pieces. And the first one is um, based on emotion. And um, it was actually a poem inspired to me by a friend of mine. She was going through emotions, as teenagers do. And this poem is about more of awareness and giving awareness to the youth. So this is called Him. It's the devilish thoughts in your mind that never leave you. Thoughts that break your wall of so-called confidence and self-esteem. He always likes to be in control. Like a really clingy friend that never wants to leave you. Instead, he's not your friend. He's your worst nightmare. He keeps you up all night screaming imperfections in your ear and stealing your reflection. Replacing it with him, replacing it with a pale-faced creature with zero amount of happiness. With him being around, everybody seems to donate sympathy to your unsuccessful charity. Everybody will experience his torture. Some more than others. But when he comes round, make sure to take cover. Make sure your mental mindset is prepared for his prodding and interference. The sleepless nights you wish you could forget but you can't, he keeps you awake. And anything happy, he showers it with this beautiful darkness that I'm so curious to understand. Trying to argue with your own mind that you're not going crazy. The line between good and bad is blurred for you. Trying to hold on to your own sanity that you're just normal, that you're just like everybody else. Right? <laughs> so that was my first one. <laughs> it's actually um, a one I performed at the Street Fest. It was a um, poem I won an award for, and this poem was called Day Banshee. It was um, based on London sirens, because we live in London, problems happen all the time, and we hear London sirens and the connotations of what it could actually mean. So, Day Banshee. Don't let her scream, don't let her shout. Don't give her any reason to come about. Don't let her become part of your deepest doubts. Just keep her calm. Keep her unalarmed, but if she was ever to be awoken from her slumber, you better be sure to take cover. As she slowly hovers awake, showering her blue and red colours all over the place. The worried parents of London call her upon, and as soon as you know it, you hear her shouting. She is screaming over your pain, and I don't know whether to call her sound a reassuring one or a painful one. Her call represents the death of so many and possibly the saving of some, but her siren seems too common in my area, drowning out every sound of happiness. As she passes, eyes dart in her direction, attention targets the Banshee of London. A moment of silence surfaces, as if somebody has already died. She shrieks some more, and I just wonder whether lives are being saved, or is it the opposite? Is it that her cries are just a facade, trying to hide the reason behind her uncanny cries, the unholy howl that needs to be exercised and begotten of? She needs to be replaced with a happy sound, with connotations of salvation, not disappointment. So I say once again, don't be a reason for her to come about. Don't let her scream. Don't let her shout. Let her rest. Let her change. Thank you very much for listening. And my last poem is actually a repeat of the first poem I, I performed and to leave you with what I started with. So, family. I'd lived a prosperous life that would always hug me when I was upset or hit me when I needed a wake-up call. But there was a time like I felt my life stopped. Like a movie on pause. I'd suffered at my own downfall. I was filled with regret. The fantasy of happiness and rainbows had become a distant dream with no real meaning. I stood and felt the fists of reality punch me so hard in the face it sent the room dancing. Life became an empty void for me. 
just nothing. No content, no color, no reason. But I'd realized something strange. Life was not the same. Her aura felt different. She was no longer helping me. Instead, she was dancing in mockery of my failing attempt to save my family. They weren't there. My family wasn't there. The world had swallowed them up, just like a delicious slice of cake, taking them away from me. But I had been lucky enough to escape the clutches of death, leaving me for dust. I was living in a dystopia tailored by my own subconscious. Why did I not help my family? I walked around guilty, as if every step I took left bloody footprints behind me. Every word I spoke made me feel weak and decrepit, agonizing pain congested my soul like a jar of nails. The memory of my family's elegant whispers saying my name made me feel so empty inside. As if my existence was just a cave and their voices were echoes in that cave. It happened so quickly. Like a blink of an eye, they'd say, and it did. One beautiful moment, my family was present. The next, they were gone. But don't worry, it's not the end of the world, right? My dad used to tell me in moments of melodrama. But you see, now they're really gone. It really is. Thank you very much for listening.